Take one, action. Australia has abundant sunshine, strong winds and vast size. There is no doubt that Australia could be at the forefront of the energy transition. But until now, we lagged a little behind other countries. In 2021, Australia got 29% of its electricity from renewable sources, compared to Denmark's 74% and Iceland's impressive 100%. So, can Australia make up for lost time and become a leader in the green revolution? I think the answer is a solid yes. Welcome to The Fully Charged Show. Like The Fully Charged Show? Then you will love our six live shows being held around the world in 2023, starting with Sydney, Australia, on March the 11th and 12th. Do we have enough solar and wind to power our whole economy? And to get it, would we have to fully tile our deserts in solar panels and plaster our coastline with wind turbines? Well, it's nothing like that. Australia gets so much sun and is so big that we would only need 0.1% of our land covered in solar panels to generate all our energy from solar. For wind, it's about double that. And that's just sticking to onshore wind. If we consider offshore wind too, it's going to be even less. And of course, the land you use for wind and solar doesn't need to exclude other activities on the land. You can put solar panels on roofs and wind turbines in farmland. So even those tiny fractions are misleadingly large. It's fair to say that we have way more than enough wind and solar potential to scale up to 100% renewable electricity if the appetite is there to install it. Fully renewable electricity sounds intimidating, but it's actually not that much more than what we're already doing. In the last 12 months, Australia got about 35% of our electricity from renewable sources. So roughly speaking, we're going to need to triple that to get to 100%. That 35% was made up of 13% from wind energy, 9% from rooftop solar, and 6% from utility scale solar farms. And the rest was hydro at 8%. There's no way we can triple our existing hydro capacity. We're not likely to add any more dams since our mountains are pretty much all in national parks and we can't really make it rain any more than it does, though we do try. So that leaves wind and solar to take us from their current 28% up to 92% of electricity. Rooftop solar is currently at 28 gigawatts total capacity, which is the result of a staggering one in three households with solar panels. Even without adding extra incentives, rooftop solar is expected to almost triple today's levels by 2030. And for utility scale wind and solar, there's currently 17 gigawatts of capacity that gives us 21% of our energy. And there is a huge pipeline of another 17 gigawatts of projects that have reached financial close. So that's already a doubling of capacity pretty much ready to go, which should take us up to two thirds of our electricity from just solar and onshore wind without really any extra effort. And looking further to get an idea of what the pathway to 100% renewables and beyond looks like, there are several published projections and scenarios. The Australian Energy Market Operator's latest integrated system plan has a step change scenario, which is a projection of where industry experts think we're headed. They expect renewables to make up 83% of our electricity by 2030 and 98% by 2050. According to this projection, in 2050, two thirds of houses will have rooftop solar and the combined capacity will increase by nearly five times. And utility scale wind and solar will increase by nine times from today's levels. Remember, that's a projection of industry expectations, not a target or even a plan. 83% renewable electricity by 2030 does match the Australian government's target. However, the target came from the step change scenario and not the other way around. So if we have the appetite to be even a little bit more ambitious, a scenario has been published for that too. Transgrid have developed a deep decarbonisation scenario in which our electricity system is powered by 100% renewable energy from 2035 and net negative emissions beyond that. But if 100% renewable electricity was so easy, we'd already be doing it. So what's the catch? Well, there are two main ones, time and location. To get to a 100% renewable electricity grid, it's not enough to have enough renewables on average. We need it when and where we want to use it. Let's start with the time part of this problem, what we're going to do about the variability of wind and solar power. We know that solar panels don't generate any power at night, and not as much on cloudy days, and it isn't windy every day or even every week. So while last year we generated 35% of our electricity from renewables on average, at any given moment it ranged from 1.6% on a windless winter evening to 66% at noon on a spring day. So if we just triple the solar and wind that we've already got, we wouldn't get to a 100% renewable electricity grid. Rather, we'd range from about 5% to 200% renewables depending on the weather. To deal with below average times, either we need to have an excess of capacity or we need storage. 
that'll be mostly pumped hydro and batteries and we'll likely need renewable gas alternatives like green hydrogen or biogas, perhaps along with some emerging storage technologies. The amount of storage that we need is the topic of much vigorous debate, with rigorous studies giving a large range, saying we need between 15 to 50 gigawatts and 300 to 650 gigawatt hours. But that's so much less than a simple back of the envelope calculation might tell you. I often see comments on social media that suggest we need several weeks worth of storage to deal with the wind and sun droughts. For Australia, that would be close to 10,000 gigawatt hours. That's a huge number, very close to the whole world's current storage capacity. But while the studies vary in how much storage they say we need, none of them are even one tenth of that amount. We're not talking about weeks of energy storage, we're talking less than a day in realistic net zero scenarios. That's because in Australia, we simply do not see long periods with absolutely no wind and no sun. While the sun sets at night, the wind doesn't go down when the sun goes down. And though it might not be windy here today, it's likely windy somewhere. This is where Australia's huge geography really helps us. The east coast of Australia is connected by a 5,000 kilometre transmission line, which is one of the world's longest. So if you look at Australia's main electricity grid, the National Energy Market, or NEM, you'll see that the amount of wind and solar across the whole grid isn't nearly as variable as your local weather forecast. And the longer the period of time that you look at, the higher the minimum renewables proportion gets. Put simply, it's incredibly rare that we see cloudy, windless conditions across the whole of the Australian east coast for even a day or two. The AEMO ISP report includes resilience modelling that looks at 40 years of historical long, dark and still periods, aka Dunkelflauter, to give it the more catchy German term. Dunkelflauter in Australia are only days long, and the report notes that they tend to be localised, with low risk of a grid-wide event. So as long as transmission is in place to connect Queensland renewables to a Dunkelflauter in the southern states, system reliability can be maintained at the current standard of 99.998%, with a lot less storage than you might think. Okay. Cue the next complaint that I commonly hear from naysayers. Even the low estimates are way more than the whole world's grid-scale batteries put together. There isn't enough lithium or other critical minerals to make that many batteries for Australia's storage needs, let alone the whole world's. Well, I have two answers to that. One, lithium-ion batteries aren't the only form of electricity storage. We've got pumped hydro, virtual power plants, vehicle-to-grid, interconnectors, different battery chemistries, and all sorts of other things that we should explore in future episodes. Let us know in the comments the ones that you want to hear about. But when it does come to lithium-ion batteries and the materials we need to make them, that's yet another example of Australian abundance. It's almost like there's a theme emerging. There are 10 minerals needed to make lithium-ion batteries, and Australia produces 9 of them. The 10th mineral is graphite, which we have reserves of but haven't started producing at volume yet. Australia currently produces half of the world's lithium and has the second largest reserves of cobalt. However, we're not really making the most of this yet. Only a tiny fraction of the total value of batteries is captured by Australia because we don't do much of the work to make them. We pretty much just dig up rocks and send them to China for processing. We could increase the value Australia gets from its mineral resources by adopting more sustainable production methods, ethical supply chains and processing the materials we mine too. Progress is underway here, but it's early days. Mining is one of the great contributors to Australia's energy usage at around 10% of the nation's total energy consumption. But Australia's renewable energy potential will allow us to make this a greener end-to-end -end process, for example by switching mining operations and transport to electric vehicles. So that's the time part of the challenge taken care of by energy storage, for which we have plenty of pumped hydro potential and for batteries we have enough critical minerals to take care of Australia's needs and export too. But that still leaves the second challenge of location. I mentioned that one of the reasons we'll need less storage than you might think is due to our very spread out geography. That's a huge advantage for smoothing variable renewable generation. But it's also a disadvantage as we need to connect all of these future wind and solar farms in remote locations. Australia's low population density tends to make transmission expensive per person. Not to mention the possibility for transmission bottlenecks if large amounts of renewable electricity are trying to get through existing lines. But here we have a problem that also creates opportunity for localised generation and storage. This means rooftop solar, household and community batteries, plus renewable energy zones or RESs. These bring together wind farms, solar farms and storage in one area with shared transmission to connect to the grid. And there are other opportunities. Australia has incredible amounts of solar and wind potential in the outback, which is hard to use domestically because it's so remote. That doesn't mean it's out of reach though. There are some bold projects happening to find ways to export these resources. 
Some of these plants are huge, with over 20 gigawatts of combined wind and solar planned in the biggest of them. They use emerging technologies like ultra-long distance HVDC cables to transport electricity, or they plan to produce green hydrogen for export as either hydrogen or ammonia. No doubt the challenge is big, but given Australia's natural resources and size, it's not insurmountable. As I mentioned at the start, there are other countries who are already close to 100% renewables, so we won't be the first to do that. But what's exciting for Australia is that we're likely to be the first to do it mostly with wind and solar, highly variable resources. Hydropower and geothermal can act a lot like traditional generators, so if a country is blessed with those resources, it's arguably more straightforward to get a highly renewable system working. Australia isn't actually leading in variable renewables yet either. Denmark has over 50% of electricity from wind and solar, far ahead of where we stand today. But we have one distinguishing feature, we're an electricity island. Denmark can share their surplus electricity with their neighbours on very windy days, and they can bring in electricity during their dunkelflaute. So, when we get to 100% renewable electricity, it will be all on us. The solutions we develop will be needed by other countries who plan to use mostly solar and wind. And that will be most countries, because solar and wind makes up the bulk of generation in most global net zero scenarios. We're starting to make fast progress. We're installing wind and solar power faster than ever, and if we continue at the current rate, we'll have tripled variable renewable capacity from today's levels by 2030. Records are being broken every year, with two-thirds of our power coming from renewables one afternoon last October. South Australia are moving even faster, and they have already gone over 100% renewable for whole days at a time, and a massive 10 days in a row last December. So that's pretty good progress for a country whose governments have historically been pretty conservative about the energy transition. For the most part, this hasn't been driven by policy. It's been driven by Australian abundance. However, there's another form of energy that Australia has in abundance too, coal, which still makes up over half of our electricity generation. Is it really conceivable that our amazing renewable potential will be enough to topple coal? Guess what? It's already happening. Coal plant closures are constantly being announced years earlier than originally planned due to competition from renewable energy and operational pressures associated with the transition. About a third of the current coal-fired generation capacity will close by 2030 based on announcements so far, and this is expected to rise to nearly two-thirds. For me, these early coal closures are the most promising sign that Australia's energy transition is unstoppable. No one is forcing them to close or paying them to close. It's not happening because of government policies. It's simple economics. Adding more renewables is now cheaper than continuing to run existing coal plants. I love that because it means we don't need to convince anyone to pay more to save the climate. And that's why I think Australia's place as a leader in the energy transition is guaranteed.